past two, and uh, the organizers have said that we should be strict on on time. And uh, I hope you have had a, a good and satisfying lunch. If not, then there is a buffet up here, which I'm sure will have all the quality that you wish for. Uh, we take off this second uh, uh, discussion about doping. Uh, we take it up uh, nice after the uh, debate yesterday. It follows sweetly. Anti-doping, saving sports, sacrificing uh, athletes was sort of where we uh, ended yesterday. Now, um, our first, uh, I, I need to say that every speaker has uh, only 12 minutes at their disposal. So, we can't expect many exams and many detours. It is the straight way to the points. The first speaker of today is Gerhard Treulein, Treulein who is Professor of Sports Science and Sports Pedagogy at the Department of University of Education uh, in Heidelberg, Germany. He has been a pioneer in the field of research into the interaction between teacher pupils and coach athletes. And as a former athletic coach, he has fought a long battle against doping. Today, Professor Troidlen will talk about how the West answered to the East German doping practice, with Freiburg as his example. Okay, thank you very much. The Freiburg case is a, a special case, um, and there are some fundamental questions in it the question of the liberty of research and the limits of research and application, the relation between research and application, and uh, finally the aims of the high-level sport. Uh, for your comprehension, you, you must know the structure of the high-level sport and the responsibility of the uh, government in uh, all these things. I don't explain uh, uh, the uh, example of France. France is a centralized republic, uh, Germany, Western Germany, former Western Germany, Germany today. is a federal republic and the responsible uh, ministry for the high level sports is the ministry of the uh, interior. Um, the ministry uh, gives money to sports and the federal states uh, uh, give money too, but uh, the sport is uh, autonomous and uh, the federations are autonomous too. That means the state gives money, the others uh, spend the money, but who has the responsibility for the res uh, results? Andrea Singler and uh, me, we have created the expression for all these things, organized non-responsibility. If something goes uh, wrong, uh, nearly nobody is responsible. Uh, when you uh, will have a look uh, to the uh, relation uh, between uh, politics and uh, sports, uh, that uh, there's a sim simple example in 40, uh, 54, uh, the team of uh, the football team of Germ Western Germany has won the um, World Championships uh, of football in Bern, and there was no minister of the German uh, government uh, uh, during the competition and, and uh, um, victory ceremony. Today, if the German uh, football team is playing, and uh, if the German football team wins, uh, often you can see or hear that the uh, president of Germany or the chancellor or both uh, are going to the uh, uh, locker rooms for con congratulations uh, to the teams. Uh, that means uh, sports have much more uh, importance today. 
in the beginning of the 50s, the, uh, I have to say that the uh, sports uh, medicine doctors uh, played or play a, a very important role in the development of uh, doping. At the beginning of the 50s, uh, the position of the Federation was clear. Uh, the German Federation of Sports Medicine believes that each drug, effective or not, should be considered as doping if consumed before the race with the intention to boost performance. And further on, the decisive point is the intention with which the drug is given and not the medication itself. Uh, the difference between the doping in, in uh, the former GDR and uh, doping in, in the, the Federal Republic of uh, Germany. In the Federal Republic of Germany, you have a development uh, bottom up. There have been some uh, uh, athletes at the beginning in the 50s who uh, did experimentation with uh, uh, doping drugs. And as they uh, were not, uh, no specialists for all this, they asked for help. Uh, the specialists for the help were the doctors, sports medicine doctors. Uh, it was a good chance for, the sports, for some sports uh, medicine doctors because uh, there has been an interdiction of advertising uh, for all doctors uh, till 2004. And the uh, simplest uh, way for advertising is uh, to present yourself with uh, high-level uh, or top-level athletes in the, uh, to the public. And uh, by this way, there was a development of gurus, uh, only uh, a little, only a, a little number during the 50s, a little bit. Uh, a bigger number during the 60s and uh, so on. Uh, there was a development of, the, of some names where the athletes uh, wanted to go when they wanted to have help. Development of the problem, um, there are uh, four uh, very important points. Uh, first, uh, decision of uh, 1966 when Munich got the Olympic Games uh, for 72. Uh, from this point, the government gave much more money uh, to the organized sports. And uh, from 68, uh, the government gave also much more money for research uh, in high-level sports because of the high altitude of the Olympic Games in 68. Another point was the recognition of the GDR uh, by the International Olympic Committee uh, from uh, 56 to 69, we have had one German team, uh, despite uh, the fact uh, that we have had two states. Uh, uh, from 69 and further on, only uh, um, to now two German teams, with the concurrence uh, between these teams and uh, the fear of the Western uh, part that the uh, uh, um, East German team will win more medals than the West uh, German uh, team. And the uh, GDR team did one more levels. Uh, one, uh, did uh, one uh, uh, more medals. Uh, the result of all this was that um, researchers and uh, functioners, uh, coaches, were looking for methods to get better, better uh, performances. I uh, will not read all this, but uh, this is an example how uh, the people uh, tried uh, to find methods for to get better uh, results. There was a man who offered a method to the uh, West German Swimming Federation uh, with uh, promising that uh, the, the swimmers will get uh, better performances and the methods consisted in pumping air inside the intestine through the awareness. Uh, nearly all high-ranking uh, persons of the West German sports uh, did say yes, uh, we want to have this and at the end 
as uh, some uh, said, there is no risk for the health. The uh, Ministry of uh, the Interior said uh, we will give uh, the money for to buy uh, these things. Uh, in, uh, when I do prevention with young people, this uh, example is much more convincing for the uh, young people than all the other facts. Uh, because we can uh, discuss uh, from this, uh, if we should discuss only the risk of uh, the doping substances and methods uh, uh, which figure on the list of WADA, or uh, if uh, we should discuss uh, other means uh, which are not forbidden or not yet forbidden. And uh, uh, the end of this is that uh, uh, um, each athlete, each coach must find his uh, position how to treat uh, this problem. <laughs> I will go further on. Um, there was a lot of help for the Freiburg Metzien and uh, Freiburg has had the first uh, chair of sports medicine in Western Germany and uh, when the new buildings for the university were, were uh, inaugurated in uh, 76, the representative of the uh, German government said I know your position, you say that the use of substances that stimulate the performances is acceptable if there is no danger to health. The interior minister basically uh, is sharing your position. We can not deny the things that athletes in other countries have been successfully tested as an aid to training and competition without any danger to the health of athletes. This assessment is inevit inevitable if we want to stay in the race among the world's uh, best in the uh, world of sport. And we want to, uh, to do it. Uh, the biggest problem is the relation uh, research application. Uh, there we have the, the example of the um, research in testosterone. There's no more time to uh, speak on it. Uh, the most important doctors in Freiburg were uh, Coyle and Klümper. Coyle was a successor of the first big uh, sports medicine doctor, Weidel. Um, he was organizer, president and member of, a se of uh, several commissions. He uh, was one of the most person, uh, important persons for the structures. Klümper was activist some years, uh, more than 2,000 patients. Uh, have uh, contacted him. Both complied with the expectations of the federal and regional uh, governments. Uh, there is a, uh, an example. Uh, an athlete, uh, former athlete, has given it uh, to me two years ago. Uh, it's a planification for the use of medicaments and substances uh, for cyclists. Uh, the, this prescription is, uh, has been given uh, by Klümper in uh, 76. And you can see on it uh, different anabolic steroids and the days they had to uh, take the anabolic steroids uh, Fotopol, Decaturabolin, Primobolan, uh, Megacrisivit. Another example uh, uh, Klümper ask for human growth hormone uh, and uh, we have the theory of the iceberg we see only a little bit for Klüber we know that he has uh, sent prescriptions to a lot of athletes in uh, whole Germany uh, during many years and not only for athletics but uh, too for other uh, sports uh, the problem we have uh, if doping uh, would have been uh, provoked uh, by the concurrence East-West, uh, there would have been no more doping after the re reunification. The contrary is right. Uh, the dogs like uh, Dr. Franke and others are barking, but the caravan con continues to move on. 
And the chiefs of the caravan are some doping doctors, politicians, who like to present them with uh, gold medals, uh, gold medal athletes, medias, and the public is begging with uh, medals. In Western Germany, no doping doctor ever lost his permission. That's very important. Um, finally, which is our vision for the future, for the competition sports, and for the destiny of the athletes? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Troy Lang. Um, it is brutal. I've been asked to be brutal about the timekeeping, and you can get used to it. Uh, next speaker is uh, Nils Zuraski, who is Professor of Criminology at the Institute for Criminology and Social Research at the University of Hamburg. Please. I started, it's not full blown yet, um, me and a colleague have, uh, have done some interviews and we're still waiting for, for further funding, we hope to be further down the road but we are not, so uh, this is a first impression on, on, on where it could be going and some highlights um, on what we want. Actually, what's the aim of the study? The aim of the study is, is to find out how athletes are telling about doping controls, um, dope testing, and doping and their sports biographies. So in, in, we're interested about the context in this happened in, in which this happens actually. I'm not, I'm not coming from the field of sports scientifically, so um, I'm more interested in the surveillance stories and the control stories behind that because I think this is an, an interesting part and I'm always interested in how surveillance actually manifests itself. Uh, what is the context? Um, is it emerging out of something that you may not call surveillance or you may not call control, but actually it is, or people not talking about it in these terms, but actually you can analytically call it surveillance or control. Um, this is a background bit, how, how, how do you cope with doping? You can do it on a legal basis. Um, we heard lots about it uh, in the past two days. You can do it on a moral basis. Um, many, of the, well, many of the talks that are given on doping have, you know, it's good or bad, and, and it's about moral, morality, uh, that it's hard to argue further on be, beyond good and bad. You can do it in a medical way, you know, it's good for your health or not, and what are proportions. Or you can do it in fair play, which is part, it's, it's a bit like, it has a bit of the moral uh, discourse, but fair play is much more, we'll, I'll come to that later. Um, what is it at stake when, when we talk about doping control systems? Um, we can talk about human rights, uh, data protection, personal, uh, right of personal data, um, infringement of privacy and all that. Um, Often it is named the integrity of sports. I've heard lots about this this morning in, in uh, relation to match fixing. I still don't know what it is. I don't know what the integrity of sports is. It seems to be something normative that everybody here understands what it is. I haven't got a clue. And nobody explained it to me. It's just the integrity of sports. What is it? So, but it's at stake, apparently. And, um, and at stake also is a moral role play. Okay? Sports athletes as, as role models. And if they don't, they lose this kind of role model. I can, can easily follow that. Um, but this is also at stake, and that might be a way to look at it. Um, so I give you a short overview on, on athletes' narratives. I wanted to call it athletes' views, but I call it athletes' narratives in this way. Why athletes? Um, we heard yesterday something about Walter Palmer on athletes' views. Um, and I think, I, I agree with him that it's, it's a group in the whole discussion 
that is treated, often treated, in a very patronizing way. They are somehow the main actors in the field, but they're regarded very often from above in a patronizing, paternalistic way. You, know, you do what you do best, and we decide how we judge it. Um, so there's a narrative on fair play. It often comes up in the interviews we do. Um, although it sounds straightforward, fair play is not. Fair play as to um, dope testing is for fairness between me and my competitor. Um, what about fair play, you know, the, dope, uh, the doping control system in my country as compared to other countries? What, you know, it would be fair if all countries would do the same amount of testing, the same system of testing. So there's another um, dimension to fair play. Um, in between sports, you know, in my sport it's okay, but in other sports. So there's, you know, athletes seem to have a very fine sensor of, 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 of fairness and unfairness, and in between, and, <laughs> their competitors themselves in, within their sports, within the national, within the international and national uh, uh, domains and, and dimensions in between sports. Um, there's another narrative that's the accept, albeit critically, you know, it has to be, uh, it's often a nuisance um, and it fringes on my, my daily life routines, um, you know. Because it's the daily life routine for athletes who are not professional, uh, who do not earn money on it, or go to school, or study, are very hot. Uh, dog controls infringe on these kind of life routines because they have to fit in somehow. Um, so they accept it as part of, of their sports, kind of a trade off, you know, I give it, um, I agree to it, so I get a clean sport, but it's a nuisance I put on, it's some extra I put on. Um, so there's a critical acceptance. Of, of the regimes that are in place, and often this also has to do with the poor software of Adam. That's their words. Um, the missing app, whatever. Um, you know, some some say you know they they can do so much good in software. This is a piece of crap. Um, okay. Then there's moral stand. You know, you dope. No, I don't. You know, it's bad. Um, so dope controls are all good. So it's a very categorical, very good. A very very sound standpoint. Um, then there's a disappointment um, narrative. Um, disappointment with the system. Disappointment with the with the amount of positive controls. That's in, in your direction. What you said yesterday. Disappointment. Um, you know, with with with, and it feeds into other narratives like fair play. You know, I thought it was about fair play, but it's so bad, and the performance of, of the whole system of controls is so bad. I'm kind of disappointed, so it's not a retreatment, but, you know, they kind of, they would be the, you know, they accept it, but they bite their teeth very hard when doing it. It's a very disappointing whole system. Um, then the tag me, is, I call it tag me uh, narrative, that, you know, I'm still experimenting with, with ways and, and grouping these kind of things. Tag me is like, you know, get, get away with all the, with all the whereabouts and, you know, give me a chip and, and we'll not done with it or, uh, or a, Electronic tag on the foot, not good for all sports because it's kind of weight on your foot. But anyway, tag me, you know, inject something in in my arm, or GPS or whatever, and and we have it done. Um, and then there's the play to the whistle um, narrative, as I call it. It has lots to do with knowledge, and it's dependent on knowledge. Um, things like legal doping, um, knowledge you have about the, what what you need for. Um, Medical treatment, in, in contrast to performance enhancement treating, a treatment, um, you have to know a lot about um, where the limit is, and sometimes you can expand the limit a bit, you know, in competition or out of competition, and then you see what happens, and you do nothing unless the whistle is blown, right? Like like you do in football, you play to the whistle, you don't stop if you feel you're offside, you just you know, shoot the goal. Um, and the referee does the reps, the play to the world. It has a lot to do with knowledge and how to, how to bend the system, how the system works. And we've got some narratives that, you know, yeah, you can twist the system. They come regularly every four weeks, so why do they do it? I can easily, you know, work my, I could easily work my doping routines around this stuff and if I would be doping. So, um, okay. And there's a lot of control, control aspects in and athletes' daily life. So why, although you know, I, I 
let's say, drug control testing, this kind of surveillance, there's already surveillance in an athlete's life. Anyway, nutrition. Some athletes more than others are obsessed with nutrition, um, and with their, of course, with their body and their performance, but mostly with nutrition. And this is something you put in your body to get something, a result out of it. Same like doping, put something in, get a result out. Um, and you watch yourself. Self-surveillance is a very strong point. Training regimes, very strong point. You know, daily life routines, very strong point. Self-surveillance and control, controlling your own, being controlled by others if you have a coach. Um, because that sometimes urges you to do something when you're not that strong of a self-controller. Um, drug testing, of course, and the LM system are, are systems that are put on from the outside um, to these control regimes. So control in sports, and as elite, we're talking about elite sports here, um, fine, okay, uh, it has very much to do with controls. And the NMs and the drug testing regimes are fed in with this. So sometimes, you know, if, if you take nutrition, for instance, you're obsessed with nutrition or what you do in your body and how, to, how this is performance enhancing, you know, then I suppose, or I, as a hypothesis, would say, well, doping is just the icing on the cake. You do something extra, over the top, play to the whistle, um, that is kind of a nutritious aspect itself. So it's not this evil, what I'm saying is doping is not this evil block, you know, you think rationally about oh, doping and doping. Some do, maybe Lance Armstrong does, but others don't. It's something that gradually comes in things you do anyway, like nutrition. Okay, this is, uh, this is a, a loosely translated account of a woman um, uh, rowing, 22 years old, German, um, and this is an account of, of uh, when I ask about you know, experiences of, of, of uh, drug testing, and obviously it was her birthday, men came to test her, um, she said, it's a mistake, it's because of the name, I'm not saying the name, so we give too much away, but the name is it's in German, it's a twister, um, and there's one one letter actually was wrong, it made a, it made a man and a woman. Um, the tester didn't want to accept the, the, the testing man thought the woman at the door was lying to him. Uh, said, it's me, it's me. It took her a while. Um, it was her birthday, it was her birthday party. The man was sitting around her. The account's actually quite funny in German. She, she took it with humor and he said, she said that the man was sitting in the kitchen four hours, you know, watching her constantly and all the friends was like, oh, who's that? But, uh, so, you know, it's the system, it, it's the nuisance that it causes, that might be an exception, I'm not sure. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure if, if we ask more athletes, they have um, similar accounts like this. Uh, well, not, not, not yet. Um, so, I'm fine. so what's the gains of the story? Um, it may show something about the complexity of dope and dope controls. Um, um, that it's not as straightforward as we sometimes think, you know, the athlete is bad, it's doping, and we need doping controls. And all the rest of it, what, what we've heard yesterday about the effective, uh, effectiveness of it. Um, athletes have some agency in saying that, and I think they all very often want the system to fair play, but they should have agency in saying uh, about the design, about the role, about the role it plays in their, in their life, in their sporting life. Um, a study like this, listening to the to the narratives of the athletes may um, generate new arguments, pro and con, in, in, in the design of such systems, um, and for the debate on doping and doping controls, or it may also ease the debate, because I, I'm hoping it takes away um, the pressure on, on some of the arguments and uh, fits in new arguments. And now, thank you for your interest. Professor Sobranski, that was uh, really uh, thought-provoking and much to discuss, but we'll postpone the discussion until the last 25 minutes or so we have uh, left when the presentation is over. Next up is Daniel Fest, Masselmann, who is a PhD student and research assistant at the Institute of Business Administration and Organization. He is together with Marcel Golden, uh, and they have produced a uh, paper here, which is an agent-based analysis of the fight against Duke.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On the one hand, I'm a research assistant, and on the other hand, I'm a professional cyclist since 2007 as well. In recent times, I worked together with Marcel Golden on the research project The Fight Against Doping and Agent Based Analysis. Marcel Golden, PhD for Business Administration, is member of the German Olympic team in shooting since 1996 and member of the German Athletes Commission as well. As you can imagine, we um, have our own experience in anti-doping and testing. Being member of the testing pool, in some we had more than 100 doping controls, blood and urine. As athletes and researchers, we are um, intrinsic motivated to force the fight against doping. All of you know that different fields of our social and economic um, life seem to be incommensurable. Therefore, the real extent of tax evasion, racism, organized crime, or homophobia is still unknown. Game theory attempts to solve this problem, but there are many limitations because high complexity is not solvable analytically. This problem can be solved by using agent-based modeling. Agent-based modeling is a class of computational models for simulating the actions of autonomous individuals called agents. Using agent-based modeling, it is possible to observe the agent's effects on the system as a whole. That's the reason why this approach is used more and more frequently in various research fields. The use of performance-enhancing drugs has a long history, and ongoing cases like the Lance Armstrong case or the Fuentes scandal show that doping in elite sports remains a persistent problem. As you can imagine, there are different ways to handle the doping problem. But there's no one-size-fits-all um, approach because there are different concepts like education, diagnostic, deterrence, sanctions or bans. The question we are therefore asking ourselves is how can we provide recommendations for the fight against doping by using agent-based modeling. The rate of direct analytical evidence for all Olympic sports differs from year to year between 1 and 3 percent and is issued by WADA. These numbers represent the detected extent of doping in elite sports. But not all doping substances and methods are det det detectable and encompassing controls are not feasible due to enormous costs. A single urine test costs about 300 US dollars and a single blood test about a thousand dollars. Therefore, figures of the WADA do underestimate the true extent of doping behavior. As you can see here, different research activities are based on various methods to approximate the doping rate, like forensic approach, self-reports or projections as well. But these uh, estimations differ essentially and goes up to 72%. Our simulation model is based on three objectives. Following the example of WADA, the anti-doping agency announces anti-doping rules and is therefore is responsible for <clears throat> the complexity of these rules. If a doped athlete is caught, he will be punished by the anti-doping agency. If a doped athlete is... Um, <clears throat> finally, the doping agency issues recent statistics on doping. After every competition, a doping laboratory controls the first three athletes for sure and additional athletes are selected at random so that no one can feel certain that he won't be tested. In the course of this, the anti-doping test <coughs> efficiency determines whether a doping center will be detected or not. Lastly, there's a heterogeneous population of athletes which compete in every period. Each period, athletes have to choose whether to take banned substances or not. These substances improve the athlete's chance of success, but athletes have to fear of being caught by taking them. Having some doping cases in mind, we consider that there is a specific mix of some influences on the doping um, decision. One of the main influences is the athlete's personality. Therefore, we consider four agent types according to the Hocamp and Pickard income tax evasion model. First, rational athletes who use doping with respect to an expected utility maximization approach. Um, and second, uh, suggestible athletes who are strongly influenced by their social network. Such a social network can be a professional cycling team, the national team, or another sports group. Third, 
moral athletes always act compliant to the rules of the system and would never ever take banned substances. Fourth, erratic athletes want to act rule consistent but are confused by the complexity of the rules and will take banned substances unwillingly. <coughs> or did you know that uh, substances like aspirin complex or wig midnight are banned substances? Let's have a look on the effects of doping on the uh, athlete's performance. On the one hand, doping has a positive effect on the performance, and um, on the other hand, it will uh, damage, uh, cause damage because um, it's bad for the um, athlete's health. Right here in the uh, blue, um, blo uh, three blue boxes, you can see the athlete's individual performance, which is the basis for the competition results. The performance depends on individual fitness F and its weighting coefficient alpha, individual constitution with its weighting co um, coefficient uh, better, and a random factor and its uh, weighting coefficient gamma as well. The athlete's fitness may increase with training and or the use of banned substances. As you can see in the fitness formula, doping has a positive effect on fitness for three periods. The doping efficiency is denoted with the um, Greek um, letter C. The effect of used doping substances, substances declines period after period, unless doping is used in one of the following periods. In contrast to the fitness, you can see in the second box that doping has a negative effect on constitution over eight periods. The damage from doping is denoted with C. There are negative effects caused by the uh, usage of doping in short and long term. The doping damage goes up for four periods and then declines. The impact of the usage of doping in following periods leads to stronger growth or decrease of the fitness, respectively constitution. Furthermore, the positive and negative effects of doping overlap in their impact on performance. The third component, the random factor, includes all other um, um, factors like uh, strategy, material, or environment. Before simulation cycle starts, some initial rounds are essential to, to generate pre preliminary data. Each simulation cycle starts with aging of athletes. Athletes who attain the maximum age are replaced by athletes at minimum age. Second, a competition will be conducted and each athlete has to decide to dope or not. After the competition, a disposed ranking will be issued. Thereby, there is no distinction between detected or undetected dopers and clean athletes. Fourth, the explained anti-doping control will be executed. Because of imperfect test efficiency and frequency, not every doping center will be caught by the doping laboratory. Based on the anti-doping test, the detected dopers are removed from ranking and a new ranking will be created. Then the income can be distrib distributed to the clean athletes and undetected dopers as well. Finally, the anti-doping agency publishes an anti-doping statistic where the detected extent of doping and other st st statistics are listed. The simulation will be repeated as often as required. The analysis of doping samples is like a race between the heart and the torches. Athletes can um, you, um, use constantly new doping substances and methods so that medical scientists have to develop new detection methods as well. Keeping doping control samples safe over years by freezing them can bridge the pro bring the problem to an end. And WADA is empowered to do this for up to eight years. For instance, some weeks before the Olympic Games of London in 2012, there was a discussion about controlling the, um, the samples taken while the Olympic Games of Essence in 2004 to, de uh, to um, detect banned substances which uh, were not detectable eight years before. Therefore, the testing uh, efficiency would increase strongly because the time uh, gap could be bridged. We already built the basic framework of our agent-based model. In the near future, we try to adapt uh, the future 
of back controlling I showed you. Using uh, the um, simulation model, we want to examine the efficiency of recent prevention programs, various uh, testing frequencies and uh, diagnostics to give recommendations for optimal anti-doping um, budget allocation. WADA can go through different situations and test new anti-doping uh, strategies by implementing them um, into the simulation model. Making use of this approach will save lots of anti-doping um, budget because trial and error in anti-doping practice can be reduced massively. We don't raise a claim to predict the real extent of doping in the near future, but we will be able to give convincing estimates for different sports with their specific characteristics. Every anti-doping feature, system, intervention of VADA or other situation you can imagine uh, um, is um, potential um, could be implemented in our simulation model to go as close um, as possible to reality. That's it. And now uh, we are interested in your opinions. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Hamelan. Uh, who is General Director of the Official National Antidoping Organization at the Netherlands. Today he will present his ideas about how to govern uh, anti-doping fight in the global uh, world. Okay. Uh, I come from talking and I my presentation. Um, I'm slightly different from yesterday for those who have seen yesterday. Today I try to be a bit more philosophical and basically what I want to talk about is where we stand in harmonization. Harmonization is a, a key issue, as you know, in, in anti-doping, and it's crucial. Um, and actually what I want to start with is only one slide, is why it is essential, because I don't doubt that for one single second. But after that, I'll move on and try to look at reality. And there is a certain tension, I think, between harmonization as the goal um, and the reality of everyday life in this world. So why harmonization is key? This is an open door. This is kicking in an open door. Athletes compete globally, of course. Sport is essentially globally. It's not a national thing, it's an international thing. And sport is governed by global entities. One of the other issues that many people have been talking about these days and will talk tomorrow and the day after. So different prohibited lists, different rules, etc., etc., are really stupid in such a world. And they lead to two basic very important things, legal inequality and legal uncertainty. For the athletes, and of course for the coaches, etc. That has been the case formally, you could say, until 2004. That was the situation. So we have now, for about 10 years, formally, theoretically, a harmonized world. But now, there is global diversity as well. It's a big world, it's a small village, but at the same time it's a big world. And in this big world, there are big differences. Thank God. It would be a very dull world if all countries were the same, all people were the same. So let's be thankful for that. But for instance, historically, um, in France, they have this yearly cycling event that you all know about. And that has led already in the 60s um, for a, to a situation where it was taken seriously as a political problem, doping actually has been on the political agenda in France for about 50 years. In the Netherlands, basically, when the national testing program started out, the big expectation was that nothing would come out, because our boys and girls don't do that. They're all nice, friendly, people you can trust, and they do all their sports based on buttermilk and brown, brown bread. That basically is what we do. And then it turned out it wasn't true. That was a pity. But that, that means that in the Netherlands, the perspective from a historical point of view is completely different from, for instance, France. Let's look at the cultural issue, which is really key, I think. Well, I'm Dutch, so everyone wants to talk to me about cannabis. Well, um, in the Netherlands, about 15% of doping cases is cannabis. In New Zealand, 65% is cannabis, so please go to him, not to me. But <laughs> never mind that. 
when an athlete uses cannabis in the Netherlands, he perceives it as something completely different from using cannabis in any other country. I won't name too many countries just to avoid problems, but um, you can imagine, I guess, that in a country where it is formally still forbidden, but there is no uh, prosecution of cannabis, um, it is perceived in a different way. And I can't explain to the public why in sports it's different than outside sports. And whereabouts is very interesting because when I heard from colleagues that when they have a whereabouts obligation, they just tell the athletes how the rules are and they do it. Well, that's a strange concept for a Dutchman because when we tell our athletes what they have to do, they start protesting, at least, at least discussing, and maybe they start a pol political party to, to do something about it. You know, you never tell your athletes just how to do it because that won't work in the Netherlands. I can assure you that. Political. The, the involvement of government is completely different from country to country. I had a, for about a month ago a discussion with the, the, the Flemish Ministry of Sport. Um, and he amazed me by knowing so much about doping, not only about the rules, but about specific cases. We could have a discussion as if he were a director of an ARDO. I was amazed because my ministry, I never met him. Never. So there is a complete different scope from the political view is how involved are we, how interested are we. In the Netherlands, when I need anything on the political level, and I need that quite regularly, I go to parliament. MPs are the ones in the Netherlands who steer doping cases. It's not government, it's not the minister. Geographical, quite clear. I've never been to Siberia, um, but I'm quite sure that traveling in Siberia, I dare say that, is different from traveling in the Netherlands. So when we have in the Netherlands, uh, let's say, uh, an unexpected problem and we want to test, I usually am capable to have that test performed within, say, one or two hours. <coughs> That's the size of the country. That's different in Siberia. Um, transporting samples. When there's a test done in Kenya, when you want to move the sample, the sample will either go to Johannesburg or it will go to Europe. And if the test is done somewhere in a place far away from Nairobi, it will take a long time, I can assure you. That's a concept which is completely different. Whereabouts, I've seen whereabouts descriptions which actually read, and it is, this is, I'm not making this up, Follow the road for about six miles, there will be three trees, then you leave the road and you find a shepherd and he'll tell you where to go. <laughs> I'm not making this up. In the Netherlands it wouldn't do, I can assure you, but we don't have any shepherds anymore. <laughs> um, and then the legal thing. Some countries have doping laws. Not much, actually. I haven't really counted them, but I know of less than ten countries that have a doping law. I may have missed a few. So the vast majority of the, say, 200 countries in the world don't have such a legal framework. Um, and, for instance, in the Netherlands, the, the privacy issue is quite big. Um, I don't think it's really an issue as it is, but there's a lot of debate about it. And we will have a doping law, actually not to help us do our job, but just to make certain that we don't break any privacy laws. That's what an extra law is made for. It's completely different from the scope of other countries. That's my perspective. I think that's reality in this world. And we have 200 countries, and we have 35 Olympic sports organizations, and they're all different. <laughs> but at the same time, to move on, we need the support. We need support. We are not isolated. We don't just work for ourselves. We don't work for sport as a, an abstract. Each. We work for athletes, and we need the support of the athletes, the public, and politics. Without that, in the end, we will not be able to move on. But if you actually want to, do, to gain and to deserve that support, our rules, our ways of doing, whatever we do, must be understandable, recognizable and acceptable within a certain community or society. For instance, the Dutch society. But you all have your own countries, your own sports. Within that society, it must be understandable, it's recognizable, etc. Otherwise, there is a structural problem. And I think there is a structural problem. 
Because there's also something like the identity of an athlete, um, which is not an abstraction either. A Dutch athlete who was born in the Netherlands is, is defined by this country, this small, low country, below sea level, part of it. Um, the, the way we discuss things, how our school system works, and of course the sport that he or she is engaged in. That defines something which I call identity. And if our rules and policies cannot be matched with that identity, we do have a problem. I can assure you, we don't test chess players, for instance. We're allowed to, we can, the legal framework is there, but thank God we don't do it. Because I really can't pass on to a chess player why we are doing it. Sometimes we do it because the International Federation asks us, but we don't do it on our own account. And then there's something like what I call individuality. That's even a step further. And that we meet once you get into uh, a certain disciplinary proceeding. Because an athlete who has trespassed the rules and who is prosecuted for that and who is sanctioned for that will in many cases understand it. He will understand that there is a sanction, that there are consequences to certain behavior. But still, it has to be, let's say, felt and seen as proportionate. And in some cases, the rule as they are now are not experienced, especially on sanction, by the athletes as being proportionate, as being reasonable. So again, there is this tension between, let's say, the, the common goal of harmonization, the rules and the policies, and everyday life. I'm a complete supporter of the World Anti-Doping Program. I'm a complete supporter of the World Anti-Doping Code. No doubt about that. Thank you. I left a few minutes out yesterday, so I get them back today. Okay. And it aims to harmonize the fight. And it, I think WADA deserves all possible support. WADA is basically in a very, very difficult position. With a, a budget which I think is not in comparison with their tasks, they try to Harmonize a world which I just showed is very, very, very difficult to harmonize at all. So they need all the support. And the code is the main tool. And I say very clearly, we must adhere to it. So do we. Even if we don't like the rules, even if we don't like the consequences, we still follow the rules. We adhere to the code. That is essential. Otherwise, it's anarchy. Otherwise, we, we can stop what we are doing. However, I think we should strive for a situation where the rules and procedures leave enough room for assessment of individual cases where you leave all these differences, cultural, historical, political, etc. Have, have a place, can be recognizable in what you do, recognizable in the consequences and the outcomes of cases. For obvious reasons, WADA is focused on harmonization. That's what they're about. That's, that's, that's why they came into being. So it's logical for WADA to still strive for more harmonization, more harmonization, more harmonization. I understand it. But in the end, the question is, do we strive for a situation in Burundi or the Fiji Islands, which will be completely the same as in the United States of America or in the Netherlands or wherever, or do we accept a certain amount of variety in sports and in countries, in the end, to make the policies more effective, more accepted, and more supported <coughs> by the public and by the politics? In my opinion, I think that we should strive for the right balance between the harmony, the harmonization on the one hand, and this diversity which is a fact of life. And the main challenge I think we face for the years to come is to find a way to on the one hand continue with the world anti-doping code and make it better and better. The next phase will start once the new code is there, we'll be thinking about the next one. And that's a good thing. At the same time, how, as a global organization, can WADA help us and can we help WADA to fit in diversity into a harmonized set of rules? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Leviathan Hendricks who is a member of the Sports Federation of Gay Games US UK. Over to you. Thank you, uh, and thank you Mr. Rob for 
setting me up for after such a fantastic presentation, something's going to be a bit less polished. Um, while he's getting this up there, I'll just say that I'm far from uh, an expert on anti-doping, and it's a bit intimidating. I just started learning about it this last weekend, actually, um, stepping in for uh, someone who was unable to make it from the Federation. That's me. Um, I can only speak to a few points today, but I would like to... My intent today is to put the experience of the Federation of Gay Games into a broader context and to set some of the issues that we think, from our experience, uh, has raised with respect to general topics of anti-doping. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with the Gay Games, they're a quadrennial event that takes place every four years and brings together about 10,000 men and women ranging in age from 18 up to the 80s. Uh, most of them are lesbian, gay, bi, or transgender. However, the games welcome everyone, and indeed are considered by many to be, in fact, the world's largest sporting competition that it's op is open to anyone to participate in with no qualifications or selection. On the subject of testing, there is no testing for sexuality for the gay games either. Um, participants register as individuals, so they're not representing a nation, and they pay their own way. Uh, the eighth edition of the games took place in Cologne. Well, I see there's many people in the house from Cologne here from the at the fantastic sports university there that you have, uh, where there were participants from 68 different countries around the world. Um, the ninth gay games will take place uh, next year in Cleveland and Akron, Ohio, uh, where there will be 35 sports on offer. Earlier this month, Paris was selected as the host of what will be the 10th Gay Games in 2018. Now, anti-doping policy of the Gay Games has been a tale of conflict and failures. After initial enthusiasm for an anti-doping policy on in-competition urine testing, the Federation has become increasingly disenchanted with testing and now favors using our limited resources for education and prevention seeing doping more as a health problem than as a cheating problem. At the same time, we believe WADA efforts have become increasingly invasive and exhaustive. Out of competition testing, ADAMS, the biological passport, are all seen as arms in the war against doping, a war in which an organization like the FGG would rather be a non-belligerent. Can measures that can perhaps be justified for a small number of elite athletes be supported when they concern the many more recreational athletes competing for much lower stakes? For us at the FGG, this is the fundamental que question raised by our experience. Drug testing at the Gay Games began back in 1994 at Gay Games 4 in New York in a single sport, bodybuilding. For various reasons, there were many positive tests. Rather than seeing this as a success for testing, it was considered proof that doping was endemic in bodybuilding, and that this sport was a problem sport. Four years later, at, in Amsterdam, at the Gay Games 5, urine samples were collected from bodybuilders, but no testing was actually d done. This was another blemish on bodybuilding and on drug testing. We progressed on to Gay Games 6 in Sydney in 2002. The Australian Sports Anti-Doping Agency was supposed to do testing in bodybuilding and powerlifting. At the last minute, it was announced that they would not test bodybuilding because of a failure to devise a suitable therapeutic use exemption. I'll have more to say on the subject of TUEs in a moment. Following on from these failures, there was a period of intense discussion within the FTG board about doping and particularly about bodybuilding. Proponents of bodybuilding lobbied hard to save the sport. A key point raised but not acknowledged at this point was that testing, which is about exclusion, can be an issue for an event like the Gay Games with its motto of participation, inclusion, and personal best. A positive outcome of the discussions was that bodybuilding remained in the program of the Gay Games, and the FGG's first anti-doping policy was created. It was designed to be applicable to all sports, but with a focus on bodybuilding, powerlifting, and wrestling, which were all to be tested by default. 
In any tested sport, testing would only be done if at least 10% of athletes could be tested. Samples would be collected from all athletes and tests carried out on the top three in each division and on others at random. At Gay Game 7 in Chicago, 2006, testing was to take place in the three target sports, bodybuilding, powerlifting, and wrestling. Again, bodybuilding was a source of problems due to a number of HIV-positive participants in the sport. For obvious reasons, the FTG is particularly sensitive to issues related to HIV-positive athletes. The FTG Sports Committee was repeatedly told that HIV-positive bodybuilders were being tested with drugs that would give a positive result in testing for performance-enhancing drugs. This was, in fact, turned out to be only partially true, and the leaders of the sport committee failed to give this claim adequate study. I thought that was someone waving a oh, clock at me. <laughs> Almost all drugs used in antiviral and other treatments for HIV AIDS are not prohibited substances. At issue, in fact, were the steroids prescribed by many, if not all, U.S. practitioners for their patients. These were prescribed off-label with only limited research to justify their use. And steroids are a part of a treatment regime that helps, con or previously helped control wasting disease for, for AIDS patients. Those defending these competitors proposed no modality for a TUE, and in fact none could be proposed. A variety of solutions were suggested, and at the last minute, the one adopted was to have two divisions, a tested one and an untested. This presents a rather strange situation of officially condoning the use of performance enhancing drugs. This unprecedented situation was made possible because of the public relations risk of very visible HIV positive athletes being able to threaten to declare that the gay games had excluded them from competing. In the 12 years between the gay games, the last gay games in Europe in 98 and the 2010 games in Cologne, the climate regarding doping had changed dramatically. The games were, were to be hosted at the German Sports University, home of one of the WADA laboratories. We've got a few lab technicians here, I see. Hands up. Um, and it was an in, inconceivable that there be no testing done in Cologne. This led to immediate, con immediate conflict with the FGG, which, after our problems with the three sports tested in Chicago, did not want to expand the issues raised by drug testing to the 10,000 registrants for the games. The FGG devoted its energy to trying to persuade our host in Cologne to limit their ambitious plans, which would be impossible to carry out in practice. The Federation warned our Cologne host committee, that if water procedures were used and followed, a great number of participants would end up ten testing positive. We tried to make them understand that there was perhaps a difference between testing positive for a prohibitive substance and doping, namely the difference is intent. A patient using a beta blocker for high blood pressure is not doping and is not attempting to cheat in a sports competition. And when you have a large population as the Gay Games does, of over 50 participants, over age 50, you'll find plenty using beta blockers. Our host committee proposed that participants obtain TUEs, but these were given via national federations, which do not select Gay Games participants. Then they proposed an ad hoc medical commission, with the risk of thousands of files being submitted. I'll spare you all the details of the many proposals that were considered. In the end, we agreed to set up a medical commission with a very limited and specific mission, to compare the levels of prohibited substances found in tests with the amount to be expected according to the prescribed doses. The, in the end, only about 30 tests were done, and somehow it turned out that none of them ended up being positive, which those of you that are more familiar with statistics might seem a bit um, unusual. In any case, the amount of discussion and tension created by the attempts to impose testing was just completely out of proportion with any real impact on the use of performance enhancing drugs. The waste of energy experienced in Chicago, and then again in Cologne, led those in favor of a protesting policy to end up reversing their opinion. 
whatever moral value there might be to testing, it just wasn't worth the trouble for an event like ours. Instead, the limited resources available would be used for education and prevention. The FTG, with only modest support from the host committee, had adapted the WADA athlete outreach model to be used in Cologne. This focus on education and prevention was at the heart of the new Gay Games anti-doping policy. Testing would be the exception, available only when requested by a specific sport and when truly justified. And even then, an untested division must be offered. Next summer, at Gay Games 9 in Cleveland and Akron, Ohio, in the U.S., out of 35 sports, only bodybuilding will be tested, and will again offer an untested division too. Our host in Paris for 2018 will need to deal with French law, but we hope that there too the focus can be on education and prevention rather than testing. So, what have we learned since this discussion began at the FTG in 1994? What's at stake? The Gay Games are not the Olympics. They favor participation over performance. They're not about finding the best athlete, but finding the best in each athlete. What works? In competition testing catches only the foolish, and an event aimed at recreational and older athletes cannot support out of competition testing or any of the WADA system. And as Professor Simon shared with us yesterday, out of testing competition, it turns out, is 4.3 times less effective than in competition anyway. What's the cost? Without outside funding, it's impossible to carry out large scale testing. And using the threat of testing without following through is unfair and undermines the principle of testing. I was shocked to hear Daniel say that the average urine test is 300 US dollars. One minute left. At what price? WADA anti-doping measures are invasive of privacy. Is winning a medal at an event like the Gay Games worth enduring the same sacrifice as the World Championship or the Olympics? I doubt it. Is a positive test conclusive? Many older, amateur, recreational athletes are unaware of the risk of a positive test for the use of over-the-counter medication. Regular medical treatments, dietary supplements, etc., they don't intend to cheat and gain no competitive advantage from their use of prohibitive substances. What about fun trying drugs? Alcohol and marijuana in particular may be prohibitive substances without, particular, without participants being aware of a risk of a positive test. Have you read the WADA code? Doping rules are complex. The list of prohibited substances is long. It's just too much to expect a casual competitor with no professional management team behind them to understand them all or to submit to their strictures. So does this mean accepting doping? I suppose to a degree the answer is yes. Uh, we could try to implement a system to prevent someone from winning a gold medal rather than a bronze, but at the price of impairing the experience of thousands of other honest athletes. This doesn't mean there are no solutions, such that there are no perfect ones. As a recreational international sport competition, we now try to focus on participation over performance. We multiply medal, medal events with many age and ability categories in each sport. It's not as hard to win a medal at the gay games, so there's less incentive to cheat. We inform about the risks of performance enhancing drugs. We attempt to integrate anti-doping policy into general health and well-being policy to educate about all sorts of risks, including safer sex and abuse of recreational drugs. In conclusion, oh, that is a conclusion. <laughs> All right, in conclusion, I may have skipped a slide there. Whether or not the WADA system is justified for elite sport, we have come to the conclusion that it's not right for us. We'd like to work with anti doping agencies to find better solutions that meet the needs of recreational competitive athletes. I suspect that there are many other sports groups that face the same issues and would like better options than peeing in a $300 plastic cup. Thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker of this session is Lassie Jörkju uh, from Finland, who is a lawyer and a doctoral student in law. Welcome.
So good afternoon, my, my name is Lassi Rikyo, and uh, you can see the title of my presentation on the screen uh, right now. Um, theoretically, uh, I guess this presentation is something you can call a sort of a conceptual or communicational study about certain, uh, certain con concepts that we're, used, uh, we're using in the specific concept of, uh, context of sports cheating. Now, when it comes to cheating in sports, uh, what do we actually mean by that? Um, my suggestion here is that we take a look at uh, history of someone's back and uh, a look at what a certain uh, pretty current, pre precisely doping athlete said about this. And of course, I'm talking about the discussion between Oprah Winfrey and Lance Armstrong um, this past January, I believe. And in that uh, interview, Lance Armstrong provided uh, his definition uh, for cheating. And he said that he had uh, looked at the dictionary during his actual heyday. And, uh, and it said there that uh, cheating is about gaining an advantage on a rival or foe that they don't have. Now, I guess, uh, theoretically, you can you can see that what what he was doing there. He was it was he was setting an internal justification for his ethical choice. And uh, I believe there are pretty few athletes who use doping who don't have such such a uh, justification. Um, like uh, I, I, my favorite is the one by Galeries in his autobiography. A thief thinks every man steals, as the Danish proverb uh, I believe goes. Okay, good. So that pretty much summed up how he felt, and I guess how many other adopt athletes feel. Now, um, the de definition by Lance Armstrong didn't go that down that well with uh, Travis Tigard, who of course is the CEO of USADA, the, uh, uh, the uh, institution that eventually brought down Lance Armstrong. And he said that uh, basically every kid knows that cheating is breaking the rules of the game. Now, if that is the definition of cheating, um, let's let's try that uh, idea in the context of what, what what is usually called the world game, namely soccer or football. Um, now, does it mean that every time when a free kick is awarded, then that is a case of cheating? Uh, in in that case, I guess every soccer player is a is a cheater, and so I don't think that that's a pretty healthy definition. So that's why we need to add a third parameter uh, in addition to what Tiger and Armstrong have thus far, thus far provided, and that is the deceptiveness of the act. Now, uh, looking, looking at soccer this way, we can see that what is typically called diving <laughs> is, is something you can call cheating, and the same applies to what, what you can call play acting or 
faking that you're injured when you're not, and this is the case of Rivaldo in World Cup 2002. And moving on, uh, you can also say that in this famous case, Thierry Henry was uh, engaged in cheating uh, when uh, France scored this important goal against Ireland, and uh, in the process uh, he touched the ball with his hand, and he didn't uh, come clean about what he had done. Now, uh, as for example this image illustrates, these, uh, all of these previous acts are, are the kind of acts that uh, are considered uh, as uh, pretty despicable uh, when it comes to the public. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, <laughs> these are widely condemned acts. Um, so, the, these acts are, are what you can call cheating, and the deception acts come from the relationship between the, the player or the athlete and the referee. Uh, however, does it mean that whenever uh, a player who uh, doesn't come clean about a certain act of rule breaking, then that makes it an act of cheating? Uh, I guess that was the ideal when, when I guess, according to the general uh, legend, when uh, soccer was invented in, in England in, in the 19th century, uh, when there was no referee and it was everyone's, uh, every player's job to, to admit when they had broken the rules. And that, of course, is the case in millions of park games uh, as we speak all around the world. However, when it comes to actual top-level sports, competitive sports, it doesn't work that way. There has to be a referee. Uh, self, this idea of self-control would be unrealistic. Uh, and, of course, you can come clean about what you, uh, your own rule-breaking, but expecting it as a kind of a default, I, I, I think that that's naive and, and uh, impractical. Now, in fact, I would uh, compare it to, to the situation where you've got a lion, a wild animal, uh, living peacefully next to a, a, let's say, a lion next to an antelope or a gazelle in, in the savannah. Uh, I mean, it, it happens sometimes, and that too look good, looks good on YouTube, but, um, but expecting it as the general norm is not that realistic. So, basically, the, the cynical reality is that referee-controlled top sports uh, uh, kind of entail this license for players to be a lion and, and to some extent, to cheat the referee, too. Now, when, uh, we're talking about doping here. How, how does doping relate to this? Well, doping is an entirely special variation of rules and it's controlled and enforced by an entirely uh, specific special entity, uh, and certainly not the referees. So uh, it's even a legitimate reason for retroactively changing the results or even stripping some Tour de France from, from a, from a uh, winner from years back and, and so on. Mm. Now, my problem here is that uh, we, we, I, I'm seeing in the society this, this myth of one sport cheating, uh, where these, these entirely distinct acts are treated uh, as if they have something to do each, with each other. Uh, doping is confused with these acts of unfair play, like diving. And, um, well, I, I have some academic examples here, but uh, I think we can skip that, because it's not that important what academics think. Because um, it, uh, only indir indirectly. Uh, but it, it's, it's about what the public perception thinks, and uh, I'm just, I don't have much time, but I'm, I'm just bringing you one example. Um, well, we've got, everyone knows this athlete here, uh, and this is a repeated uh, a, a, a player who has tested positive for doping and uh, many times. However, that is not the reason why the world thinks that he's a cheater, well, I guess especially England. Namely, it is this act from 1986. Uh, the hand of God, uh, and if you, if you go and Google uh, the world worst cheating uh, in sports, uh, you're going to have a hard time not finding a list where this is not the number one act. Although this is basically a wild animal doing its job, or gamesmanship, or whatever you want to call it. Or have you seen uh, the British Prime Minister Cameron taking a stand against um, match fixing or doping? No, but uh, then in this. This act of uh, biting in, in field, he, he took a stand. Now, the, the problem is that uh, 
it, it comes down to what I talked in the beginning, these internal justifications uh, for the players' actions. And, and we shouldn't help create justifications for doping. And there is this uh, danger of doping ending up blurred uh, with these entirely distinct forms of so-called cheating. So m my suggestion here is that um, we should, uh, when, when people are, are bringing these uh, distinct concepts together, uh, we should uh, raise our voice and say that basically what you're doing is, is the equivalent of comparing crime in the rest of the society uh, with bad manners. No one would do that in their right mind. However, somehow we do this in context of sports. Now, so that's why I think it's about time to stop the hypocrisy uh, involved in sports and uh, let lions be lions and let's go and catch the real cheats. Thank you very much. That was the end of seven uh, very uh, thought-provoking uh, presentations. Oh, and now we have uh, 25 minutes for uh, a discussion. Pardon? It was it was absolutely fabulous. Good. Um, there is a question there. Hi, it was a German TV air. Do you have a question to? I don't know how to pronounce your first name, Leviathan or? Uh, yeah, uh, Leviathan. Leviathan. Okay. Um, Considering all the practical problems you have at the gay games regarding an anti-doping um, policy, I would like to know um, if your federation is acknowledged by the IOC or by Sport Accord. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Is the Federation of Gay Games acknowledged by the IOC or by Sport Accord, by the um, international federations? I'm not sure that it's within the IOC's purview to acknowledge other international sports competition or not. Uh, I know that we certainly it's do have federation. dialogue. With I, I talk about the federation, not the, not the gay games. Mm. Uh, well, we certainly do have a dialogue with the IOC and have had many meetings with them and do lobby for um, equality within the Olympic movement. Um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> because you would have to acknowledge the water code. So that is the background of my question. Okay, again, um, as I hope I stated in my pre in my um, prelogue there. I am not. I know nothing more than what I've said about our uh, <laughs> <laughs> testing policy. I apologize for that. Thank you. Well. Uh, since there is no other questions just right now, I want to pose a question uh, to the panel as such. And, and uh, the question that, that, uh, that, that uh, I'm struggling with is what my really concern about anti-doping, the fight against, against anti-doping, is that uh, I fear that it may be a battering ram for uh, surveillance regimes being uh, accepted in other uh, walks of life. I see it in Denmark, we started very hard on, elite, uh, 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 on doping in elite sport, then it moved on to, uh, uh, with the WADA with uh, rules being uh, uh, applied to recreational drug use. I've seen in, in Britain that there are people who are talking about starting to take, uh, 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 to learn the lesson from sports and and apply that into, um, into the university systems where we can see that there are students who are doing drugs. And since we have accepted the surveillance regime as we have in sports, that might spill over. Is that not a concern to any one of you here? Uh, the answer is yes, of course. Um, it, it, it kind of goes to what I tried to explain already. Um, the present rules tend to go beyond what they were meant for. Um, for instance, like you say, sports, um, grassroots sports, was not the goal of the World Anti-Doping Code. We, we would not have a code if it were only about grassroots sports. Uh, at the same time, there, there may be a doping issue, but that would actually ask for a different set of rules, or a simpler set of rules, or, or less consequences, or whatever. 
So that goes to diversity, diversity of rules, uh, diversity of possibilities actually to apply the rules. It also goes, as far as I'm concerned, to, to, the, to the gay games. Um, I think there could, there could be a doping issue that you have to tackle, but the approach by the World Anti-Doping Code, and I think you explained it very clearly, is a dead end. It doesn't work. I think, well, I, in my terms, you would say it's a function cream. There's not, there's not so much of a technology, of, of a procedure, or a legislation functional, functional cream. Um, I think it has a lot to do with, with the context of, of professional athletes. There is a context of, of, of capital, uh, of capital gain, of consumption. Um, in a, in a society that's very much about control, about uh, individual responsibility, going away from from, um, from a welfare model to a personal model of responsibility. Um, universities work the same way. Um, I don't know, do you need the microphone? Okay, shout on. Um, univers universities and the workplace or recreational drugs, I think it, it creeps into that. And once you have one model that works on the asset, so, so perfectly well in, in, as a, as a harmon, harmonizing, harmonizing legislation, you can take this and put it into, say, universities, and then you can you, know, you can uh, play the game or, or, or play the rules of inclusion and exclusion. That's all it does. I mean, the water code is about inclusion and exclusion, and I, I got reminded about this when, when uh, the gay games uh, were explained about the inclusiveness of this. And universities may be about that, success or failure, inclusion, exclusion. The workplace is about this. So um, I see, see the regime, but if, if you want to establish a surveillance regime, you always have to, you know, someone to force it into and, and others to accept it by, by way of, you know, by, by, by the law, by criminal law, um, you know, not conflating the two, I, I found that aspect. So there's a power aspect, aspect to that as well, but certainly your, your, um, um, your thoughts. Uh, I share your your uh, your worries in, in that respect. Um, did you have comment? Yes, a, a very short comment because you say professional sports, and I just want to stress it's not about professional and amateur. That's not the relevant difference. The majority of, of top athletes are amateur, um, so it, it's about elite sport or amateur or uh, or uh, grassroots sport, for instance. Not about professional and uh, non-professional sports. I think. Uh, and going to the question from uh, from amongst the people uh, present here, of course, IOC recognition as it is now means that you have to uh, completely comply to the code. Um, and I think that's very relevant. Organizations can themselves decide whether they want to have IOC recognition or not. Um, and in general, I think that too many organizations strive for this recognition because it may bring them standing or even money or whatever it will bring them. But as a consequence, they have to accept the World anti doping Code. Personally, I still think that having a, an international testing pool for chess players or bridge players um, is a rather stupid thing. And the, the final person in, on this round was uh, Gerd Treutlein. And then the... Yes, uh, I think I We are speaking a lot of the control of athletes. And we don't speak of the control of the environment. Andrea Singer and me, we have uh, done uh, more than 10 years ago a lot of interviews with uh, uh, former athletes. And in these former athletes, there have been uh, 13 top level athletes. Uh, and we have seen if the environment is really against doping. Uh, there's a big chance that the athlete uh, doesn't dope. But if the environment is pro doping, there's a big chance that the athlete dopes. Uh, uh, what do we do for uh, first for the control of the, the environment and second for the uh, prevention? Uh, we have uh, not enough investment uh, for prevention in nearly all countries. Uh, Paul listeners, um, I was very glad with the presentations today because yesterday, uh, to me, it came as a sort of uh, a shift 
in the uh, struggle against doping as I was uh, present with a whole uh, forum of crime fighters. We had to do with a criminal world and there were all crime fighters uh, and everyone was suspects and suspicious uh, but now today I'm happy that we have heard more about the sportsmen themselves. I want to uh, put a question forward. What you see in sports, I was glad with the photograph of uh, Suarez, he did the same in Holland. He, he with, with 23 cameras around the field, he bites an opponent, right? Everybody said, he's crazy, he is crazy. But what happens is that that guy is frustrated and is in a way uh, pushed forward by his own hormones. I'm speaking here as a psychologist. This is neuropsychology. You don't need at that moment the cocaine. You got your own adrenaline on the same receptors on your nerves. This looking at a guy like that as if he is insane or probably have used some uh, medicine makes them in fact a criminal. I would say that also the guys who are going after them are trying to be as good as athletes want to be. So the doping hunters from their ideals want also be the best in the world. And that gives a big, big risk. And <clears throat> I'm so sad that your recent uh, publication, Werner, was not part of this Congress. Werner has published uh, in September an article called Who Guards the Guardians? And he's pointed out that the uh, idealistic and the, the well, you, maybe you can, <laughs> you can put it yourself better, there are risks in the moment that you think you have to be the best doping hunter in the world and that your ideas are sacred. Then you come in the, in, in, in the circumstances where uh, other fundamentalistic groups and even, as I called it in 2007, the Inquisition was also. I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, who of you wants to uh, uh, react on the fact that also, doping hunters should be guarded in how they hunt uh, athletes like, for instance, Solaris. I, I just need to say that, that I, it's not planned. I have not asked for this good publicity on my article. I'm a little bit embarrassed. Uh, so, uh, but there may be a comment. Um, so, at least we are uh, minimum two. Um, athletes, former athletes here in the room that had uh, some urine control. It's Walter, I guess you had some, or Daniel and me, and we're talking to now to the system. And if you can, uh, or you can't imagine how a doping control at home works, so someone rings, then you have to open the door. He said, oh, I'm Mr. Miller from the, from the doping laboratory. You have to drink some water, that you have to go to toilet, and then in your own toilet you stand there with the trousers down to the knees, with a t-shirt, maybe pull up, or to the to the what's yeah, to, to the arm. And in your own toilet someone looks to your shoulder if you are male and you wait until some pee get down to the box for three hundred euro at all. And this is at home. Imagine you are maybe at a bar and he said, oh, I know he's in the bar. And then you are visiting the toilet together with uh, maybe two, three or five other people. And one guy looks, oh, the other guy where the key comes out. And this is... Okay, game should do this. <laughs> And so, um, to answer the question, you can do this as the, as the man who have to guide all of this in a good way, or you have to find uh, the big 
um, doping scandal and every athlete is doped and I have to do this and I really look where the last uh, milliliter comes out um, and this is for the male. For the women they have a mirror and look where uh, there the pee comes out. And so this is really, really um, yeah, this is for in the first time I had in the athlete this um, I have to drink two and a half liter and I can't I can't go to toilet uh, because I'm very afraid of this. And so yeah, of course you have to control that you have the right person who do this act of a doping control. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, I, I think. Uh, at least I encounter these kind of uh, opinions on the on the invasion on the athletes' privacy pretty often, and well, at least my opinion is that um, I think that people are aware that that uh, this do doping testing comes with a price, and so uh, so of course there there are going to be some uh, unpleasant experiences for athletes and. I, I, it's not a good thing, but um, this is not the first time in the world history when, when, um, when you try to achieve something good and that is is beneficial for the athletes in the end, and uh, where, which, um, that has some uh, weaknesses. I don't think that, that that comes to a news to that that much people that people might think. Uh, we have just uh, uh, two more uh, uh, brief comments from the panel, and then we have two questions. First from the back, and then Ms. Thomas here. Yeah. Uh, actually, three short uh, comments. The first is I was on the forum yesterday, I was there today, so maybe I'm schizophrenic, but I try to be consequential. I don't think it was completely different yesterday from today, what I said. Secondly, um, doping hunter is, uh, is a label that is put upon us by the public and especially by journalists. I hate the label and I think it should be quite wise to avoid this label because it puts the stress only on part of what we are doing and basically it's the part that the public is interested in. It's not the part that the public is not interested in, prevention, medication, etc. Thirdly, and that's the main question and it's an open door as well, of course we should be checked. It's as simple as that. Any game, any work in, in, in this world should be a matter of checks and balances. That's an anti-doping as it is in anything in, in, in the world. It's as simple as that. The main question is how to organize it. And I think there's a, a lot of room for improvement there. But the question is completely uh, simple as that. Of course, there have to be checks and balances in anti-doping. Just to, to last thing, I, I, yeah, I, think, oh, I would, I would I would warn to petify I, mean, I know there's a price, yeah, you can say there's a price to pay, I would warn to petify that price, you know, that, yeah, to pay. because yeah. if, you take, if you take alcohol controls in the streets, there's a clear, which is, the, 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 the intoxicated driver is much more of a risk to other people, and the police has to follow a certain procedure, at least in some countries, um, of what it can do, it can't have a urine test, it can't even have a blood test just like that, um, it's, you know, blowing that funny apparatus. Um, so there is, and it's much more dangerous to be alco alcoholic behind the steering wheel when to be, you know, out of competition, um, doping, whatever. So I w would want to petify the price that is to pay. There is, but don't petify it. Super, the point is made there. Uh, we have a, a question down from the back. Um, just, to, just to build on the previous discussion around professional and amateur, um, coming from Australia, um, I can tell you one of the, the key concerns of doping in rugby is at schoolboy level. And it's critical that um, we're seeing, because we're seeing not just in Australia but also in South Africa and I think in the UK, um, a, a culture of doping going into schools and mafia type people preying on those schools, particularly the, you know, the, the well-to-do schools where they're paying a lot of money. Um, so I think it's in, it's important to recognise that it's not just a function of professional and standard amateur, but you've also got to go down to these levels. I mean, we saw not that long ago somebody in a Grand Fondo cycling race 
tested positive for EBO. Grand Fonda, that's like a you know community cycling event. It's it's just quite staggering how far down this can go. So that's more of a How could they afford that testing? On the Grand Fondo? Ask her, she's from they the They paid for it. <laughs> uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of events that contract to do testing, because I think one of the issues we haven't discussed in this session is the fact that there are a lot of athletes that compete at what people would like to term an amateur level that also want a clean playing field. So if I'm an athlete who may just happen to be 35 and I happen to compete in a master's event, but I'm an excellent swimmer and I want to be competing against other 35 year olds and I want to stay competitive, I don't want to be competing against somebody who's doping. So there are a lot of athletes at that master's level that have gotten together at events and said we want to have testing in our event because it matters to us, it matters to us that we will compete on a, a clean playing field and they've worked together to try to get testing to come to their events for that specific reason and, and that's not to say that there's not a lot of education that goes into helping those athletes understand their rights and responsibilities prior to that happening, but to have this notion that those people just don't care is completely inaccurate, from my experience, from what okay. we can handle. It, it's a very valuable comment, and it uh, shows us how easy it, become, it is to become a cheater, because you just jump the line. Sorry, uh, it was uh, <laughs> Sorry. delayed in the front here. Well, actually, I'm glad you said that, though, because uh, Laura Robinson from Canada, and I did race on the national team in cycling, and my winter sport was cross-country skiing. Those are two well-known doping sports, and I'm sure I raced against many people who were doping. And with the perspective of age, <laughs> maybe unfortunately, but I actually don't care if you want to know the truth. And I'll tell you why. It's because when I look at all the other unfair practices in sport, doping is the least of my concerns. I started talking about sexual abuse in sport way back in 1992. Uh, it's still a massive problem. It's a much, when I looked at all the cycling coaches who were helping themselves to teenage girls, I mean, doping was nothing. We're not talking about the real unfairnesses in sport. And so, uh, Lassie, when you said it's ultimately beneficial, I'm not sure of that because one thing doping, like mandatory doping does, we talk about the tag, it teaches athletes how to um, obey orders, and there's almost no end to that. And if you look at things historically, you'll find that athletes, in terms of nationalism, have obeyed orders um, at the 36 Olympics in Berlin, for instance. So, so the, the performance of the athlete becomes more of a... Uh, a prop militarization, propaganda, I think we see it in a, in a sort of hyper-capitalist culture now. All the, I'm a journalist, all the emails, the, the press releases I get from the Conservative government in Canada is the Harper government supports women's rugby. Well, it's not the Prime Minister, it's people, all Canadians who have paid taxes, who are paying so women can play rugby. It has nothing to do with him, actually. But the, and the athletes are now being used as these propaganda tools uh, for a very highly stylized, and I would argue highly surveil, uh, surveillance-oriented state. Um, yeah, um, well, that's, that's a really interesting point of view, and, and with all the, the historical perspectives. Um, uh, I guess my, what comes to my mind first is, is the, the idea that um, this juxtaposition between uh, sexual exploitation and, and uh, doping. Um, well, I don't think that there is anyone disagrees that sexual exploitation is much more worse issue uh, in the society, but uh, I don't think that it's it's similar. Similarly, it, it's not related to the sports and and the competition in the in the same manner as as um, doping is. And uh, and with regard, I, I just want to make, make one one thing clear that when I spoke about doping as a crime, I mean I know that doping is a is a crime um, in many legislations, but I mean I, I meant to use it metaphorically that in the context of of these of these Arab variations of uh, of wrongdoing in sports, it's it's what you can call a crime next to them. Wonderful. <laughs> we are just.
just in time. Thank you very much for uh, for wonderful presentations and a good uh, discussion. I think we should uh, end this session with a round of applause.